Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Elephant Team. Uh, my name is Joko. Today I'll be speaking, uh, speaking with Nanjala Nyabola. Uh, Ms. Nanjala is, a, is an author, of, uh, is an, is an author a, a writer, a political analyst. Uh, right now, uh, not in Kenya, but her mainstay uh, analysis is really around Kenya and Africa broadly. Uh, welcome, Nanjala, to the Elephant. Thank you. Uh, Nanjala, just, just to uh, start this brief conversation, uh, one of the hot topics uh, internationally uh, is around migration, uh, mm. around, around migration, and particularly now we, you know, we're seeing climate change, what's happening, uh, economic crisis, mm. there's war in the Ukraine, Russia. Uh, but but every time we talk about, every time conversation comes up around migration, there's always this this, this particular strand of narrative that centers uh, it's the people of the global south going to the global north, in particular Africans. Mm. Uh, going to the global global north, and uh, and I think mm. uh, and the like Ukraine Russia was has, has in a sense broken that uh, paradigm. Uh, but mm. uh, why is it that it's still now that we're not able to really just uh, break the whole thing and and have a much more human human humanistic, uh, if I may, uh, lens around mm. migration broadly speaking. Yeah, I mean, that's the challenge. It's the question though of the moment, isn't it? Um. I think globally, so there's there's two things that are happening in parallel. One is the legal conversation on migration and the international law, especially conversation. So global, the idea of migration legally is broken down into many different categories. So you have refugees, you have migrants, you have temporary workers, you have people who are victims of human trafficking, you have um people who are so there's all of these uh, different legal categories tourists and they're all covered by different um, legal regimes and one of the conversations that's happening is that there has been an erosion of some of these legal regimes um, for, especially when it comes to refugee protection but also for example the complete absence of an international convention on internally displaced people and the vast majority of people who are displaced in the world today are internally displaced people are people who are displaced within their own national territory and so one of the big things is that um we're seeing a slow erosion of the global refugee protection uh, regime and the absence of mechanisms for protecting IDPs and the absence of global solidarity for protecting both of those people. And there's anxieties about that because the vast majority of people who are displaced in the world are in the global south and they don't leave their region. They don't cross international borders, but there is no funding, financing, even when there's displacement. You saw, for example, in Pakistan, where up to one third of the territory's national landmass was underwater because of the flooding. That's climate change. And that's climate change for which Pakistan is responsible for like 1% of global emissions. And so this, this whole conversation that's being had about is the absence of a global IDP mechanism part of this broader conversation of Northern countries, and that includes China, um, not wanting to take responsibility for the world that they are creating in the global south and what kind of legal conversation needs to happen around that so that's one conversation um and the other conversation that's happening is really about the politics the domestic politics of the countries of the global north and again this includes china um, and, and asian countries like uh, japan south korea and this is really an internal politics, the politicization of borders. And in that conversation, people from the global south are really victims of tooth of xenophobia and racism. And so even though very few people relative to the global, uh, the IOM uses the word stock. I'm not a huge fan of, of that phrase, but um, relative to the global population movements, you know, people who are trying to go to the global north are actually a very small percent. And yet, the Iranian Sea, because all of global border deaths happen at the Mediterranean Sea. 
and the other big border where a lot of death is happening is the uh, US Mexico border. So that's not really because of numbers and that's not really because of population movements per se, but it's about the domestic politics of these countries and the fact that they are trying to politicize refugees, especially, but asylum seekers, migrants, and of all stripes as a way of projecting political power. And so the border becomes the site of projecting power and, and con contention. And so I think those are the two things that are happening that, you know, on the surface, it looks like it's the same problem, but actually there's two things that we have to um, handle with, you know, different Africans sort of doing research primarily in Africa, what would be really important for us is to articulate a narrative about population movements that is authentic to what's what's happening, that, you know, African countries don't generally shut borders on each other. Generally, there are many exceptions. There are a handful of exceptions, but generally, um, in terms of, of crisis, because of the way it, the artificiality of African borders, you do still get a lot of that cyclical movement. And how do you have a border politics in Africa that isn't rooted on European anxieties about xenophobia and racism, I think is one of the most urgent policy questions in international relations in, on the continent today. I'm piggybacking on Pata Nanjala talking about borders. Uh, a lot, a lot of particularly that the matrix of our coloniality. Uh, we talk about borders. European borders were meant to keep everybody else out, right? <laughs> and then after mm -hmm. borders, I mean, uh, borders in the corner were meant to keep the natives in. How, how would you comment on this, this, this issue, uh, especially now when we can see that there's, that there's a aggressive contestation of coloniality, whereby. Uh, the idea of racial order is wobbling, and, and and it's not able to sustain itself. How do we how do we have migration conversation around conversation around borders, but also when broadly speaking, the nation states? Well, that's a great question. I think the first thing is that the border isn't just a physical space; it's a concept. Right. It's an idea around both statehood and personhood. And it's an idea that really is about political cultures and, and how domestic political cultures are articulated and, and implemented. Um, that's one thing. And that is part of the reason why one of the first things that colonial governments do when they arrived in a territory was they, they created borders, they drew lines um, in the sand. Um, the other piece of it is that migration, human mobility, is a fundamental part of human um, life. People have always migrated, and that is reflected in our cultures. It's reflected in our languages. It's reflected in um, you know, all of these race stories that are happening around the world. Migration is as old as time, and human mobility is as old as time. And sometimes it's toxic. And and I I I always say that I think one of the fundamental anxieties that exists in the West is that other people migrate with the same motivations that they did. And so when they talk about, you know, when the UK Home Secretary talks about invasion, who has actually invaded who in the last 100 years of human life, right? So it's a it's a kind of like an inverse um, projection of domestic politics. Um, and then the third piece is that there's also a class element to the way people understand how mobility functions in Africa. So there are wealthy people relatively not maybe not in absolute terms whose ideas of african borders are shaped by their experiences at airports and so there is definitely this sense of it's so hard to travel in africa it's so expensive and try to travel in africa it's so difficult to travel in africa because your primary experience is through the airport well you know africa is a big place it takes nine hours to fly from um, uh, Mogadishu to Dakar. Um, that is literally, it's not even the longest flight um, on the continent. And so, you know, 
that yes, there are issues there about how our regional tax reg regimens are constructed and airlines and all of that and lack of connectivity on the continent. Um, but it is there is that layer to it also is that there's a that's a class thing. At the very local level, Africans are incredibly mobile. Twenty thousand people cross the DRC. Uh, Goma Giseni border, DRC Rwanda border every day. Busia, uh, Lunga Lunga, um, uh, Moyale. Um, if you actually go down to the non airport borders, you'll see that there's a lot, you know, on the other side. Busia, they actually have family in Uganda and the, the, they were there. It's the line that came and found them there. And they are now being told, you are Mudia worries brother is an MP in Uganda and yeah. Mudia Wari is a vice president <laughs> in Kenya. That's a, an, an artificial line that he, but they, the line found them there. You know, Moody's in his nineties, the line found him there. Um, and so there's a different paradigm that is difficult to, to, to surface because it's people who are not, who are, don't have that um, rhetorical power. They're not you know, it's not you being studied at universities. It's not being studied conversations and things like that. And those are the people who are actually going to be victims of the Europeanization of African borders. Because, for example, what's happening in the Sahel is that the European border is actually being projected into the Sahel. The border politics and the border cultures of Fortress Europe are being used to reorganize borders in the Sahel. And criminalize movements that have been happening. The Trans-Saharan trade is 400, 500 years of African mobilities. And, and now we're being told these people are all traffickers and smugglers and they must all be arrested, detained, and everybody has to do fingerprints when they buy metrics, when they cross borders, and they has to be this, and it has to be this, and it has to be that. And the labor disruptions, the human disruptions that come for that feed into this jihadist um uh pastoralist clashes that are happening in the Sahel. So that is a product of what you're talking about, um lines in the sand that reflect external political realities and not domestic political realities in a very real contemporary uh situation. You'll see the same thing with um uh the Somalia Kenya border, right? That that projection, the reason why there's a hardening of the Kenyan-Somalia border, it's not just because of terrorist attacks, um, you know, coming over the border. It's also the fact that there's a demand coming from Western governments that as part of addressing the terrorists, the fear, anxieties about terrorists, Kenya has to be securitized, right? It loops all the way back to why do we have to have seven border checks before we get to JKIA front gates? That's a projection of borders coming from somewhere else. And so all of which is to say there's a class element in there that for more Africans, mobilities are actually more fluid, that the international border is actually um, relatively easy to cross, even though the people who are experiencing African mobilities at airports are going to have a, a completely different experience. At the airport, it is 100% easier for a European to cross an African border than it is for an African to cross many African borders. And that is also, again, race, class, all of that issue. Um, so the long story short is that um, these three sort of aspects, basically that the border is where a nation state tells a clear story about who the citizen is not right? Borders are predicated on negative definitions, that it's not that you have to prove that you belong. It's that you have to prove that, or they, they you have to rise above a threshold of that assumes that you don't belong. And that politics is very much grounded on what's happening in the domestic sphere. Because it's the domestic sphere that decides what the categories of belonging are. When you look at, for example, the United States and this idea of Latino, this idea of that a person is Latino, well, Latino as a political category is actually incredibly 
empty. Our why is a white Cuban uh, emigre more Latino than a black uh, Jamaican, right? Even though Jamaica is also a Caribbean island, Cuba is also a Caribbean island, or someone from the Bahamas. Why are people from the Bahamas not Latino? Is it just because they don't speak Spanish? A black Cuban is Latino, but a black um, uh, person from the Bahamas is not. That is domestic politics. That is the creation of a sociopolitical category for a specific national. And it's not always sinister. It is to create a political is to articulate um, to a, a doctrine of resistance against the marginalization of certain ethnic groups. That is all valid, but it is more to say that what then comes out of that is a certain border politics where Haitians can be excluded from defense of uh, migrant rights because Haiti doesn't fall into the rubric of Latino and Haitians can get even within a system where there's second tier treatment of Latino immigration, Haitians get an even more second tier experience of that. That's domestic politics at the border. That's the fact that Haitians don't have the same political power. We are living right now is a crisis of statehood and especially a crisis of the states of the global North because um, these are countries where there's been this convergence of politics. It's very difficult to distinguish between new labor and the conservatives on most issues. It's very difficult to distinguish between the Democrats and the Republicans on most issues. It's very difficult to distinguish between the Christian Democrats and the social Democrats in Germany on the vast majority of issues. So to gain power, they have to find that issue that says we are this and we are that. And they're appealing to this very narrow sliver of voters who tip the scale, right? Because they all have their bases. And then there's this narrow sliver of voters who tip the scale. And so how do you sway those people? Well, you create an enemy and you show yourself strong as the person who can best defend the patri against that enemy. And that enemy shifts uh, its Black people, Black immigrants, it's Asian immigrants, it's Arab immigrants, it's um, whoever. Now in the UK, it's Albanian immigrants, it's students, it's anybody who does not have enough of a domestic political constituency to, uh, to say, I am not the person that you say I am. I am deserving of rights, even though I'm not a citizen. I am deserving of human treatment, even though I'm not a citizen. And it's that absence of political constituency that makes migrants and refugees such a potent target for these rhetorics of xenophobia. And that makes the border, the place where the state defines its power or reifies its power because everywhere else the debates are more or less settled. Georgia Maloney isn't going to challenge, in Italy, is not going to challenge the EU. She's not going to pull a Brexit. She's not going to leave NATO. She's not going to do anything radical anywhere else. Where can she show herself strong? It's on immigration. It's on refugees. It's on kicking the out the, the other. And so this is the crisis. Um, the border crisis where it exists is really about how power is shaping itself and defining itself in the nation state the crisis of the nation state in the global north, whereby power, the search for power uh, at all costs requires an enemy because the state is defined in opposition, has to have that domestic opposition, has to have that contention. So, I mean, so this is a long story. <laughs> my last question, Angela, before I let you, mm. well, I mm. talk the whole day, I think sent you the whole day, but my last question. So then how then do we start thinking beyond the nation state? Because this is really the crisis. I mean, I would go in and say it's the matrix of power. I mean, like the colonials. Yeah. Them, and I'll talk about, I mean, the, all, all the all the normative frameworks of, you know, patriarchy, yeah. you know, capitalism, etc. The then how then do we start uh, thinking of belonging and not even nationhood, new civilizations around yeah. 
around this European anxiety that is projected within the space Onto of, us. of the nation state. How do we how do where do we start? I think we first have to make room for political for politics to be somewhere else and the politics of belonging to not be a function of the state. I think we give too much um I think the state's doing entirely too much mm-hmm. as an entity. It's a religion, it's a uh, way of life. It's 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 entirely too much. And Bourdieu talks about the state as a network of relationships rather than a structure. And I think we we have to make room for different networks of relation that it doesn't always have to become a state function. And I think we have to be a, a comfortable with this um uh, you know, people can belong to different political entities and have social functions that don't necessarily have to be interpreted uh, through the state. I always wonder, what would the world look like if we accepted that weak statehood was fine? You look at countries like Bhutan, for example, whereby there's monarchy, but then there's they're just kind of accepted that our ambitions are not to be like the best and the most powerful and the most big whatever state. We're just going to get on with the business of the stuff that we're doing domestically. And then you look at, I think, countries that opt out of the geopolitics of always state in the room and this, all of this other stuff, I think, end up making room for other ways of thinking about social and political organization. So I'm very, very much enamored by that. Um, I've never been a huge fan of statehood as a as the core you know and i'm i'm always keen to see if we can elevate maybe it comes down to decent what is this what does decentralized belonging look like what does recognizing all of these multiple spheres of belonging look like i think if there's a thread that probably unites most of the work that i'm doing right now i think that would be the thing that i'm most curious about can we be elsewhere and the state is telling us that we have the power to define your identity because it's your biometrics, it's your uh, grandfather, father, father. It's that the ID ID cards are all about trying to tell people who they are, and what it does is create these narrow buckets of where people must belong to. And if you don't belong to that, then you don't exist. Yeah. People in India who don't have fingerprints are being told if you don't check these boxes, you don't exist. I think that's really violent. I think that's really really violent. And so. Can we have a room for a different uh, discourse about where people politics happens? Um, I don't have a simple answer, but I think I think it's a super urgent question, and I'm I'm I personally am very interested in it, exploring it further. Thank you so much for your brief.